And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Bleak, lonely, evil. Such are the moors of England, where even today one can go for mile on mile without sight of another house or another human soul, where death-dealing quicksand bogs and mires wait to trap the unwary walker, where many who enter are not seen again, and where some of those who are seen again are strangely changed. For example, Sandy and Jack Burton. We didn't see it, Jack. Wrong, Sandy. We did. We couldn't have. An Elizabethan headsman? An executioner in a black hood with an axe dripping blood? No, I don't believe it. Sandy, we saw what we saw. No, we we saw what, what our nerves saw. We saw what that moor out there made us see. You talk about the moor as if it were a living thing. A living, breathing, malevolent thing that can kill us if we let it. Our mystery drama, The Executioner, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Tony Roberts. Few will deny, I'm sure, that weather and climate play a great part in our lives. To a large degree, affect our mood, our nerves... People in warm and sunny climates tend to take life more casually than those where the weather is cold and bleak. What I'm getting at is that one of the characters in the tale I bring you now is not a person, but a moor. Moor. The very sound of the word strikes a note of dread to the soul. Dread, but fascination too. For believe me, there is a certain allure in evil a compelling magnetism which some cannot withstand. Two such people were Sandy and Jack Burton. Jack, how much further to Linton? Twenty, thirty miles. Not sure. We'll never make it by nightfall. We may not make it at all. The road is running with water. I try to go faster in five miles or so. The engine gets wet and starts to die. The wiring is soaking wet. That old farmer was right. We should never have taken the shortcut across the moor. He warned us. What, honey, I wanted to see the moor. I've never been on a moor in all my life. (laughs) There's a writer. There's a writer who's supposed to be on vacation. Resting and recuperating from a nervous breakdown. You promised me. On the plane over, you promised not a stroke of work till we got back from England. What's that? It's wet wires. I better slow down a bit more. All you've been doing since we landed is take notes of this and notes of that. You filled I don't know how many notebooks. Well, I am a writer, and it's sort of second nature to take notes. Yes, I keep hoping I'll hit on an idea that'll pay off for an article. Even better, a series of articles when we get back home. All I wish. All I wish is you just plain stop worrying when you ought to be resting. And you... Oh, Jack... It looks like we've uh, bought it, as our English cousins say. You you mean we're stuck? I'm afraid I do. The water on the road's gotten deeper. It's practically a lake. Well, what'll we do? Let's see if we can find shelter for the night at that castle on the hill. <laughs> what castle and what hill? That hill over there. I see a hill. I don't see any... It's shrouded in fog, but when the fog lifted for a second or two, five minutes ago... There. See? You're right. There is a castle or it's a house or something. You think you can make it that far? Oh, I'll make it. Anything but spend the night out here in this awful, absolutely awful moor. Sorry to trouble you, ma'am. Uh, 
My name's Jack Burton. Uh, this is my wife, Sandy. Our car broke down on the road below, and I'm afraid we need shelter for the night. Not here. But, ma'am... I said not here. Oh, now, just a minute. Jack, don't argue. That man... I see him, but big as he is, well, never mind. Ma'am, we're in a serious situation. Our car is stalled and what's practically become a lake. In common decency, you've got to let us come in. Honey? Jack, look out. That man... Now, hold it, chum. All I'm asking... Hey, wait a minute. Get your hands off me. Dunning, don't hurt him. Just put him out. Put who out? In weather like this? Never mind, Dunning. Too late. Mrs. Drood, what's going on here? Who are these nice young people, and why was Dunning putting them out? Sir, our car is stalled on the road below, and with night coming on and all, we were hoping you could put us up until morning. Well, of course we can. Come in, come in. Dunning, close the door. Permit me to introduce myself. Sir Leonard Hastings Brook. And this is my home, Bodmore Manor. My housekeeper, Mrs. Drew, with whom I shall have a few words later about her lack of hospitality. And this is Dunning, man of all work. He cannot speak. He's a mute. But he can hear well enough and carry out orders. And you, sir? Jack Burton. And this is my wife, Sandra. We're Americans here on vacation. We were taking a shortcut across the moor to Linden. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. You can fill me in on the particulars later. Right now, you both look like drowned rats. Uh, <laughs> a very pretty rat in your case, Mrs. Burton. We must get you both into dry, warm clothes. You're awfully kind. I can't thank you. And... What? What's that? What? I beg your pardon. I heard it. I thought I heard it. I heard it, too. Someone screamed. Oh, just a trick of the wind, that's all. The wind? Yes, yes. Howling about these old manor houses, it can sometimes make the strangest and most nerve-wracking noises. Well, I shall look forward to seeing you again at dinner. If you... Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mrs. Drood. Jack... That wasn't the wind. That was a scream. It sure sounded like it. Oh, Jack. Jack, let's leave. And go where, Sandy? Where? And so you see, you're not only dining in what was called the Great Hall in Elizabethan times, but at the very table graced by Her Majesty... The Virgin Queen herself. Then, if I follow you, Sir Leonard, Bodmore Manor was owned by Elizabeth I? Uh, Her Majesty Elizabeth I. Her Sovereign Majesty. Oh, well, yes, of, of course. Did she uh, use it for any special purpose? She? Oh. Her Majesty used it as temporary quarters while one castle or another was being renovated. How uh, did it come into your family, Sir Leonard? Well, it was a gift from Her Majesty to the first Sir Leonard Hastings Brook when he was knighted in 1584. For performing some worthwhile service, I'm sure. Worthwhile? Special might be a better word, or, or, or distinctive, or, or peculiar. Peculiar? My ancestor, the first Sir Leonard, was special executioner to Her Majesty. Executioner? <laughs> Head... Head chopper, you might say. Little family joke. Oh. <laughs> and uh, many of his victims, I suppose, I should say Her Majesty's victims, were dispatched right here at Bodmore. I thought that most, uh, if not all, executions took place at the Tower of London. Oh, most of them did. Most of them did, especially when a public beheading was considered useful. But there were times, too, when Elizabeth found it politic to remove certain malcontents, hotheads, other threats to her power in secret. And here, at Bodmore Manor, was where those executions were carried out. Oh, but scream! There it is again! That was a scream, Sir Leonard, uh, not the wind playing tricks. It was a scream, wasn't it? I didn't want to admit it the first time. Indeed, Mr. Burton, I hoped it was nothing more than the wind, but since you and your wife have heard it a second time... You, you heard it too, didn't you? You all heard it. Oh, no, no, no. Only those on whom the curse of Bodmore is about to fall ever hear it. It's the scream of someone about to be beheaded. 
just before the axe falls. You didn't hear that scream? Oh, no. Mrs. Drood? I didn't want you to stay here. The curse of Bodmore, what happens? Nothing, if you follow orders. What orders? There is a room, the room at the far east end of the corridor where your own bedroom is, that you must never go into. Okay, but why not? Do not go into it, that's all I tell you. The room is locked, but there have been those who forced the lock and came to a sorry end. I warn you, don't try to enter that room. What's in the room, Sir Leonard? Believe me, Mr. Burton, it's best you not know. Can it be that horrible? Oh, my dear, horrible to you is but a word. On my 21st birthday, my father took me to that room and showed what is in it, and horrible became to me actuality. I beg you, as you value your sanity, as you value your life, stay out of that room. <laughs> Jack? Jack? Here, honey, by the window. What are you doing over there? Why aren't you in bed? Oh, just looking out at the moor, thinking. The rain stopped, and there's a moon. Yeah, with black clouds scudding across it. What have you been thinking about? Yeah, not thinking, exactly. Wondering's more like it. Wondering about this whole freaked out setup. Sir Leonard and Mrs. Drood. I'm wondering, could I do an article if I can find the right handle? Did we hear that scream? Really hear it? Or was it just the wind? Well, Sir Leonard said... I know, but... Well, was he maybe just taking advantage of the circumstances, us thinking we'd heard a scream? But why would he? I don't know. That's what I've been sitting here trying to figure out. All I can come up with is that he's playing some kind of childish game. He doesn't act like a child. No, but... Come on. Come on to bed. No, no, no. You, you go on and on. I'll sit up for a while yet. Jack, what are you up to? Up to? Me? That room at the end of the corridor... Now, whatever gave you the idea that I would... Jack. Honey, it would make one terrific article. If there is anything in that room, something really horrifying or whatever, or even if there isn't, the experience we're having here right now, I mean, the car stalling, Bodmore Manor being Liz the One's private execution place, the curse, the whole bit. I mean... I can sell it like that when we get back. You are not supposed to be working. Dr. Delmar warned oh, you. And, yeah, and sent me his bill at the same time. Now, you don't pay that kind of bill and a few others that are bugging me by resting. All right. Let's go. Well, you don't have to go. I have to. Now, question. Sir Leonard said the room is locked. How do you propose to open it? Simple. You've forgotten that article I did on safe crackers and lock pickers. You're right. I had forgotten. All right, if you're ready. Come on. Well? Coming? Just the sight of that long corridor. All those suits of armor lining the walls. Look, go back to bed and I'll... No, no, go ahead. I'm with you. something, isn't it? A big glass case filled with clothes worn in the 16th century, I guess. There's no need to guess. Look at that one there. If that wasn't worn by Elizabeth I, the jeweled high stand-up collar, flounced sleeves sewn with semi-precious stones. Oh, Jack. Elizabeth herself wore that. Yeah, I guess she did. But look, it's oh. the inside of that room down there that I want to get... What's that? I don't know. I thought I heard... It sounds like so someone's... Coming from the end of the corridor. Jack. Jack, look. What? Where? There. Walk 
walking through the patch of moonlight, walking towards us. No. Oh, no. What is it that Sandy and Jack see? Wish I could tell you. Matter of fact, I could, but uh, there's a place for everything. And everything in its place, I say. I'll return shortly for Act Two. Now we're in the Burton's room at Bodmore Manor. It's a little past three in the morning. And as you can see, Jack is trying to revive Sandy, who fainted, I guess. But come, stand with me here by the window for a moment and look out across the great mysterious moor. Silent. Silent as a grave in moonlight. Brooding. Waiting. For what? For whom? Come on, Sandy. Come on. Snap out of it, honey. Jack. What? Here, yeah, drink, with... drink this. Oh, Jack. I... I fainted. I... I don't blame you. Oh. Gruesome. Horrible. I've never seen anything like it. If I really did see it. You saw it. We both saw it. An executioner, a headsman, black hood, black doublet and hose, and the axe. Gleaming silver in the moonlight with blood, ruby red, dripping from it. And coming straight toward us down that corridor out there. Oh. Well, what happened after I fainted? He vanished. Vanished? Or maybe he just slipped away into the shadows. But, Jack, <laughs> was it a ghost, do you think? I don't know. It could be we... Oh, Jack! Easy. Who's there? Mrs. Drew. Oh, that awful woman with her jet black hair pulled back and that long white face. Would you open the door, please? Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Yes? May I come in? Uh, well... Uh... Thank you. Are you all right now, Mrs. Burton? Oh, yes. I... How did you know I wasn't all right? Nothing goes on in this house. I don't know. I know the dangers that lurk here. The mind-shattering things that can happen. That's why I've come to warn you again. Again? Sir Leonard warned you at dinner. Warned you to stay away from that room at the end of the corridor. I knew, even as he warned you, that he was arousing your curiosity. That at the first opportunity, you try to find out what lies behind that locked door. That's what you did, didn't you? Yes. Take care. Don't do it again. If you do, you may not leave Bodmore Manor alive. We... we are in danger of death? Nothing less. I don't understand. No need to understand. But the, the... You saw the headsman, did you not? The headsman with his axe dripping blood? Yes. Count yourselves fortunate that you only saw him. That you still bear your heads on your shoulders. Still? Are you saying there's a murderer in this house? Am I telling you something you didn't already know? Didn't already feel? Haven't you felt its loathsome presence? Who? What are you talking about, Mrs. Drood? The moor. The moor, child. It more than surrounds this old manor house. This house that reeks of blood. It's poisonous fog slipping under doors, through cracks. Smell it. The dampness, clammy and moldering as the grave. Bolt your door and do not leave this room till I come for you in the morning. Under no circumstances, leave it. The dame is spaced out. A yo-yo. Bolt the door. Okay, okay. But if she thinks she can keep me from finding out what's in that room... She doesn't have to. What? I'm keeping you from that room. I'm keeping you in this room until morning. Oh, Sir Leonard. I've been waiting for you, Mrs. Drood. What are you doing out of your quarters at nearly four in the morning? 
What are you doing in my quarters at nearly four in the morning? The Queen has sent word that she wishes to be present at the next execution. Her chambers must be put in readiness and all else required for her comfort. See to it. Of course. I've already instructed Dunning as to the axe. I want it sword blade sharp. It will be. You can depend on Dunning. What troubles me is... And I depend on you, Mrs. Drood. Have I ever given cause for doubt, Sir Leonard? Not until now. Take heed, woman. Her sovereign majesty, Elizabeth Regina, demands unswerving loyalty of her subjects. I warn you, try no more to save another's head, lest your own be forfeit. Is your car, Burton, none the worse for wear, I should think? Yeah, if the wires have dried out, Sir Leonard. See if it will start, Jack. Right on. Well, we figure Linton to be about 30 miles away, Sir Leonard, according to our map. Oh, 30, give or take a few. You should be there in an hour. Oh, less than that. 30 miles? It's more like 60 on this road, Mrs. Burton. I say, Burton, your, your car sounds a bit sick. Yeah, it certainly doesn't sound good. I'm going to have a look under the hood. The hood? Oh, uh, the bonnet. <clears throat> I can't... I can't find anything wrong under the bonnet. I'll give her another try. You know, Mrs. Burton, I'm rather hoping your husband won't get the car started. Why? I, uh, lead rather a lonely existence out here, and I shall be sorry to see you go. You're more than delighted to have you stay, you know. Well, that's awfully kind of you, Sir Leonard. I... I wish we could, but we do have a schedule to keep to. In fact, we'd better. We're booked on a flight out of Heathrow next Monday. It's no go. I mean, she just won't start, and there's no sense in wearing down a battery. These wires have got to dry out. Well, schedule or no schedule, Mrs. Burton, looks as if I'll have the pleasure of your company at least through luncheon. And if my stars are right, perhaps through uh, dinner, too. Well, it seems that way. I'll hurry on up to the house and tell Mrs. Drood she'll have preparations to make. Uh, you two can saunter along at your leisure. Enjoy the morning. All right, Jack. Level. Level? What did you do to the car? Me? To the car? What are you... I know you, husband mine. I know you all too well. You're going to find out what's in that room if it's the last thing you do. Sandy, I have to. I mean, there's something really hairy going on here, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it, because if I don't, no editor will buy the article I intend to write. I don't care whether the editor... I do. I've been out of circulation too long. Lord knows how many contracts I've lost, and heaven knows we could use the dough. Now, I've got a hot article in the palm of my hand, Sandy, and I mean to play it for all it's worth. Now, no more talk. That's the end of it. I hope you're right. What? I hope it isn't just the beginning. The beginning of something I'd rather not think about. Mrs. Burton, I saw you sitting out here on the terrace, brought you a cup of tea. Thank you, Mrs. Drood. How very thoughtful of you. Not at all. Sir Leonard tells me your husband couldn't get the car started and you'll be spending the night with us. Yes. Well, if you must, you must. Can I get you anything else? Oh, thank you, no. The tea's enough. In that case, I'll... Mrs. Drood? Yes. What you said last night, in the middle of the night... About the moor. What exactly did you mean? If you need ask the question, I cannot answer. I don't understand. Some things in life can't be put into words. There are things. Things of the spirit. Beyond words. Look out at the moor now. With the sun all rose and gold. Setting in the west. What does it look like to you? What feelings does it bring to you? Why, it looks quiet, beautiful, serene, lovely. Yes, but within the hour when the sun is gone and the mists begin to rise from the boglands 
when the moonlight plays strange tricks. It will be anything but quiet and beautiful and serene. It will be pure evil. Mrs. Burton, I strongly suspect that if your husband wanted to, he could get your car started. Take my advice. Persuade him to do so. And then leave Bodmore Manor. Leave as quickly as ever you can. Eleven. Now's as good a time as any, I guess. If I could only make you listen to reason. I am listening to reason, but mine, Sandy, not yours. Now, I'm the one in this family who has to make the bread. Oh, you don't think I'm going to let you go there alone? I would rather. If you hadn't fainted last night, I might have found out then what's going on here. Don't worry, I won't faint. Not this time. No. No, I can't be sure of that, Sandy, and I've got to find... What is that? Drums. Sounds like muffled drums. Muffled drums? Yes, I've read somewhere that they were used just before someone was executed, beheaded. Elizabethan times, I mean. Let's go. Jack, that sound is coming from the other end of the corridor, from that room. Whatever's going on, now is the time to see what it is. Come on. Now, quiet. Try not to make any noise. This corridor... So dark. So full of shadows. Smells. It's coming from that room, all right. The drums. Shh. Listen. What's that? It's voices. I know, but Sandy, the door. Look. It's a jar. Thin crack of light. You can see it. Yes. I'm going to see if I can open it quietly. If you have no last words, place your head on the block. Please accept the small bag of gold pieces, Executioner. Dispatch me quickly, I beg you. It shall be done. There now, your head. Place it on the block so it lieth properly. Yes. Jack. Jack. A beheading. Woman with a head on the block. When I stretch out my hands... The executioner. That will be my signal for you to strike. Axe raised. Now. He strikes. Oh. Head. Head. Rolling around on the floor. Oh, Jack. You... Oh. What's that? That's how... What? Master Dunning. We are observed. That man standing in the door... Seize him! No. No, wait. Now, listen. Seize him, Master Dunning! Seize him! And bring him to the block! I don't want you to worry. Jack and Sandy Burton are going to come out of this all right. What intrigues me, and should intrigue you, is not that they will escape, but how... Will they escape the headman's axe? The truth is that if it hadn't been for some quick thinking on Sandy's part, some of the quickest thinking on record, well, back in a minute for Act Three. In a manor house that dates back to Elizabethan times, a frightful scene is taking place. A beheading. Ignoring the orders of Sir Leonard Hastings Brook, owner of Bodmore Manor, and the warnings of Mrs. Drood, Jack and Sandy Burton dared to open the door of that forbidden room. To their horror. For on the very moment of opening it, they saw the great axe of a headsman fall and cleave the head from the body of its victim. That man, standing in the door. Seize him, Dunning, seize him, and bring him to the block. No, stay your hand, Dunning. Mr. Strood, you dare countermand an order I have given? Nay, Sir Leonard, I dare but entreat that you give a moment's thought to what you are about to do. Dunning, fetch him here. Oh, oh. I say, hold. You forget yourself, oh, mistress. Nay, sir, you forget who I am. 
Who are you, then? Minerva Drood, first lady in waiting to Her Majesty. <laughs> I represent the Queen in her absence, and I have the right to give orders as she might do were she here. Well, it's the first time I've ever heard of such a right. Your ignorance, sir, will not protect you from Her Majesty's wrath, should you dare take my entreatment lightly. But, but there stands Sir Jonathan Burton, a traitor to England and to Her Sovereign Majesty, if ever one lived. Jack, he's pointing at you. Not proven. Not proven. He has not even been put to the question. Yes, but I thought... Well, never mind, I shall look into this at once. Come, Dunning, we must consult the records. You, Mistress Trude... Remain here with the prisoners. But, Sir Leonard... Do as I bid you, madam. Dunning, come. Mrs. Trude, what in heaven's name is this all about? Use your eyes, Mr. Burton, and I think you'll have the answer for yourself. Jack, that... that figure kneeling at the block, it's a dummy. As you can see, a storefront mannequin dressed in Elizabethan clothes. The head, just a dummy's head. Uh, the the executioner, the uh, headsman in the long black hood. That was Sir Leonard? Yes. Is he crazy? Again, yes. Oh, good Lord. Nothing to be alarmed about, oh. Mrs. Burton. In any case, not until now. But I'm afraid he's begun to take a turn for the worse. Yeah, but what's just happened here? I don't get it. Let me explain. Bodmore Manor was, as Sir Leonard told you at dinner last night... A secret place of execution used by Elizabeth I. Sir Leonard, of course, knew this when he inherited the estate on his 21st birthday. You see, he had never been what you might call mentally stable. Learning he was the descendant of a headsman was all it took to send him over the edge. He's harmless, you said? Yes, or has been till now. Until now, when these seizures came on him, about every three months or so, we put on the little act you just saw... I would pretend that an order of execution had come from Elizabeth. Sir Leonard would get dressed in the headsman's outfit, the original, by the way, and we'd go through this mock beheading, even to the sound of muffled drums, recorded on tape, incidentally. Good heavens! Yes, it's all rather mad and ghastly, but harmless. Till now. Now I can't be sure... But I think his mania has begun to make more violent demands on him. In other words, he... Beheading a dummy doesn't seem to satisfy him anymore. He remains restless, unsatisfied. I don't like to think this. But I'm beginning to fear that he may... He's returned. Sir Leonard. I am in your debt, good mistress... There is nothing in the records to indicate that Sir Jonathan has been put to the question. You see? And so we must put him to the question. Master Dunning is at this moment preparing the Star Chamber. A Star Chamber trial? Is that not what Her Majesty would wish? I suppose so. As for you, Sir Jonathan, found guilty or not guilty, you will at least have the comfort of knowing you were accorded... The highest honor of trial in Her Majesty's own tribunal. Come, sir, to the Star Chamber. Is it not true that you, Sir Jonathan, allied yourself with my Lord Essex in his abortive attempt to seize the reins of government? The attempt which cost him his head. <laughs> Not me, Your Honor. Oh, you laugh, sir. In God's name, be serious. And address me as, uh, uh, what was it, uh, 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 Your Honor? Well, either you will show proper respect to this court, sir, or it will go hard with you. Uh, now look, uh, Sir Leonard... Be I... serious, and it's my lord, Jack. Uh, my lord, I didn't mean to upset you, and I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Well, you see to it. You, uh... Deny any allegiance to my lord, Essex? I do, your, uh, I mean, uh, my lord. And what of your association with Sir Mortimer Shawcross? Sir Mortimer Shawcross? I've never heard of him. Oh, 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 you've never heard of Sir Mortimer Shawcross? Why, are you serious man, or are you again showing contempt for this court? My lord, I assure you... That... This court has heard enough. I pronounce you guilty. Well, okay... 
I'm guilty. And such being the findings of this star chamber, you are hereby sentenced to be executed at dawn tomorrow morning. Dunning, take the prisoner to the place of execution there to wait the headman's axe at dawn. I shall retire to rest until that time. <laughs> Look, wait a minute, Dunning. I'm... Come on, now. Dunning, no rough stuff. Play acting is play acting. This is going too far. This is true. Warn him it isn't play acting anymore. Look, if it isn't play acting, damn it, Dunning, let go of me. What is this? The real thing, you foolish man, the real thing. You and Lady Sandra will remain here while Sir Jonathan's execution is carried out. Within, I assure you, the next hour. I beg you. Entreat you. Beg not, entreat not. It will gather you no recompense from me. Oh, Mrs. Drood, what are we to do? What am I to do? Keep our heads about us to begin with. Sir Leonard, poor man, has gone completely insane. No question of it now. This time it won't be a store mannequin he beheads. It'll be the real thing. Jack! If only he'd listened to me. Left well enough alone. Well, he didn't. That's beside the point now. The point is we've got to save him. How? We're no match for him and Dunning, even if we could get out of here. Oh, we can get out. That's no trick. What? I read an article of Jack some years ago on safe cracking and lock picking, that sort of thing. That bolt on the doors will be a piece of cake with a charge card. A charge card? I think I can slip that bolt with one of my plastic charge cards. But then what do we do? Cross that bridge when we come to it. Well, well, it's coming. It's... The bolt is moving, but I... You've been almost an hour at it, and you said it would be simple. I also said I'd only read Jack's article. I never tried it out. The bolt's slipping. We'll... We'll get this door open all right. The drums... The muffled drums. Mrs. Burton, I can tell you, you have ten minutes. Ten minutes before that axe falls. Now, look. Look, you two, this joke has gone far enough. Dunning, take it easy, will you? The straps are biting into me. Listen not to him, Dunning. Bind him tightly. Tightly! You're crazy, Sir Leonard. You have gone stark raving mad. Oh, no, Sir Jonathan. My name is Jack. Jack Burton. I am an American, a writer. I am... You are a traitor, sir. And as such, you shall die. Good, Dunning, good. Bring him to the block. To the block? Open the door. Who knocks? Miss Drude. Mistress Drude. Not Mistress Drude. Mrs. in heaven's name, come to your senses. Don't you realize what you're doing? Drop the harness. Sandy, save me. They, they bound me with straps. They're laying my head on the block. Oh, Lord, no. This nut, he's pulling that black hood over his head. Mrs. Drude, he's going to kill Jack. Doesn't that manage you to chop off my husband's head if we don't stop it? How? I don't know. I don't know. Wait. The costumes. Mrs. Drew, the costumes. Costumes? In the glass case. Queen Elizabeth's gown, the one with the high neck and the jewels. What of it? Get it. I can't. The glass cases are locked. We'll break the... Oh, never mind. I will. Help me, please. Please help me. What are you doing? What good can those costumes... Stop talking and help me get this on. Quick, Mrs. Drew, quick. Help me. Sandy, help. Dunning, don't let him do this. He's crazy, can't you see that? He's gone right out of his head. Dunning! Sandy! This is Drood! Help me! Open up! I, Elizabeth of England, call on you to open this door. What? What was that? You hear me, Sir Leonard? It is your queen who speaks. Open this door. Door! Dunning! It is Her Majesty. She's here. Open the door, man. Open it! Your Majesty. Your gracious Majesty. What find I here? What knavery is this? Well, Your Majesty. Put down I... that axe this instant. Put it down, I say. Or your own head shall fall beneath it. Put it down. 
wrong. Well, yes, yes. Yes, of course, Your Majesty. I wished only to obey Your Majesty, to do my duty, to send from this world a traitor who threatened traitor? your... Traitor? Sir Jonathan Burton, a traitor? Are you mad? I have no more loyal subject, no dearer friend, than this man whose life you would have taken. Fool, leave at once, be gone. But your majesty... Go! I go. I go. Sandy, you saved my life. With that costume... It's the one in the glass case, Jack. The one Elizabeth herself wore. And it, it suddenly struck me. No, no, God gave me the idea that only Elizabeth herself could stop Sir Leonard. <laughs> it was as simple as that. Simple, perhaps. Brilliant, definitely. Mr. Burton, your wife has told me that you are a most accomplished writer, but somewhat inclined to have things your way. May I give you a word of advice? Right now, I'll take anything. Have things your way if you must, but listen to others, especially your charming and decidedly practical wife. A bit more than you have in the past. Otherwise... Otherwise? Otherwise what, Mrs. Drew? You may indeed lose your head. <laughs> A strange story? Yes. Incredible? Definitely. True? Well, I can personally vouch for its authenticity. How? Uh, now what have I got myself into? Uh, well, uh, you see, uh, the truth is that before I became an actor, I was a writer. No, no, wait a moment. I didn't say I was Jack Burton. I didn't say that at all. I'll be back shortly. then, the truth will out. I was Jack Burton. Pen name. Real name, well, you know it. No matter. Important thing, you enjoyed my story. I hope you did anyhow. And another important thing, very important to me, I've still got my head. I do, don't I? Our cast included Tony Roberts, Marion Seldes, Jacqueline Brooks, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.